here, especially delighted, of course, to welcome to London our special guest for tonight, Dr. Jennifer Webb, a true Aussie, uh, an exceptional academic and friend of Cyprus, who will talk about Cyprus in the Middle Bronze Age. Professor Webb's lecture inaugurates the symposium Cypriot Archaeology, Pre-Modern Material Culture and Cultural Heritage in the United Kingdom which will take place tomorrow morning at UCL, University College London Institute of Archaeology. Uh, this exciting lecture and symposium on Cypriot archaeology is the result of a fruitful collaboration, as Marius pointed out, between the Cyprus High Commission Cultural Section, UCL Institute of Archaeology, and the British Museum. So I would like to pay, to pay special thanks and tribute to Dr. Thomas Kiley. Thomas, where are you? Get up so everybody can see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Curator of Cypriot Antiquities at the BM, at the British Museum. Dr. Maria Di Comitu Iliadu. Maria, where are you? Get up so everybody, everybody can see you. Marie Curie, postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology, and of course, my cultural counselor, Dr. Marius Psaras, who needs no introduction, right? <laughs> good. I haven't introduced myself. All right, good. <laughs> um, I cannot emphasize enough how much we value our long standing relationship of mutual support and collaboration on multitude levels with the British Museum, Thomas. Uh, it is our third joint event. Despite this, of course, it is our third joint event uh, with the UCL Institute of Archaeology uh, in the last 12 months. We particularly cherish this growing and flourishing relationship with the Institute of Archaeology, as it is a world-leading academic institution which has nourished Cypriot archaeology since its infancy. Indeed, many distinguished Cypriot archaeologists, archaeologists have been awarded their doctoral titles by the Institute of Archaeology since the 1950s, including former and current directors of the Cyprus Department of Antiquities, as well as the Archaeological Research Unit at the University of Cyprus. Generally, for our Cyprus home, these lectures have become a crucial part of our strategic plan, if you like, to showcase and promote Cypriot cultural heritage in the United Kingdom in collaboration with prominent academics conducting research in, on, or Cyprus. Tonight's speaker is, of course, no exception. While of Australian descent, Jennifer Webb is as much Cypriot as any one of us. So we claim it. <laughs> She's one of the most widely published archaeologists working in Cyprus documenting with accuracy and interpreting with solid evidence ancient Cypriot material culture. She's chief editor of the renowned archaeological series Studies in Mediterranean Archaeology, which showcased Cypriot archaeology in its Mediterranean context, with distribution in all major libraries around the world. A truly benevolent mentor she is always supportive to young researchers, generously offering her vast knowledge of Cypriot prehistory and guidance in material studies. Hi, Emma. More recently, Professor Webb has un under uh, undertaken a most important task, the full publication of archaeological sites located in the Turkish occupied part of Cyprus, sites that were excavated before 1974, but remained neglected or undocumented ever since. By, by studying old excavation, journal, old excavation journals, discovering old maps, photographs, and notes, and associating them with the surviving material in the Cyprus Museum, Professor Webb has managed to bring archaeological sites in Garni, Ambelo, uh, 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 Ambeligu, and Lalithos back to life, making them part of current literature and thus filling a significant gap in research. And for that, we are thankful to you, Professor. 
Her lecture tonight is precisely about such an archaeological site located in the beautiful village of Lapikos. Dear friends and colleagues, I am confident that uh, the professor will be most illuminated, her uh, professor's talk will be most illuminating talk that I'm sure all of us will enjoy. Uh, without much ado, I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Jennifer Webb. But before I do that, in my old age, I'm becoming a photographer <laughs> because whether we like it or not, digital is part of our life, uh, including Twitter. So I would like each one of you to give me a huge smile because I want to <laughs> Your Excellency, the High Commissioner for the Republic of Cyprus, thank you so much for that very warm welcome. Uh, friends, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants of, uh, in uh, tomorrow's uh, symposium, uh, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a huge honour to be here and I was just so, I've been looking forward to it for months from the other side of the world. Um, I would also like to thank, before I start, uh, the organisers of tonight's event and tomorrow's symposium. Uh, Mr. Mario Sapsaras from the Cyprus High Commission, Maria Di Comito uh, Eliabu from, uh, from UCL, and Do Dr. Thomas uh, Kiley from the British Museum, my friends and colleagues. The um, focus of, of tonight's presentation will be, uh, as you've already heard, the Anglo Cypriot uh, excavations at Lapithos in 1913, which uncovered 62 uh, tombs of the Early and Middle Bronze Age and on the work which my small team and I uh, have been doing over the last few years to bring this material, uh, or the material that was recovered in those terms, to full publication. I also hope to convince you along the way um, let's see, this is, yes, uh, of the importance of publishing old excavations, both because, as Sir Mortimer Wheeler famously wrote, all excavation is destruction, and excavation without publication is wanton destruction, and in this case specifically because Lapithos is on the north coast of Cyprus and the northern half of Cyprus, as you know all too well, has been inaccessible to legitimate excavation since the Turkish invasion of the island in 1974. As a result, it has rather dropped out of focus for many archaeologists uh, whose work has uh, necessarily shifted to other parts of the island. I think it's very important that we redress this imbalance uh, if we can, and that we retrieve as much as we can from earlier excavations in areas that we can no longer work on directly. I also want to propose a somewhat new understanding of Cyprus in the Middle Bronze Age. And by the Middle Bronze Age, um, oops, I thought that was uh, something else on that slide. Um, I thought I had the dates on the slide. Um, by the Middle Bronze Age, I mean the period between about 2000 and 1700 BC. Um, I want to propose a new interpretation, a somewhat new interpretation, one that suggests that Cyprus was rather more interconnected with the world around it and developing somewhat more complex economic structures internally than is generally speaking currently thought to be the case. Um, there are many reasons why the north coast of Cyprus might have played an important role in the Middle Bronze Age. It lies within sight uh, of the south coast of Anatolia which is about 65 kilometres away at the nearest point. And in the early second millennium, the period we're talking about, the Middle Bronze Age, the maritime trade routes which linked southeast Anatolia to the Aegean uh, and the Cyclades passed between the north coast of Cyprus and the south coast of Anatolia. So communities living on the north coast of Cyprus were very well placed to engage with this sea traffic if they had the capacity and the desire to do so. All the more so, because this was a trade in raw metals, copper, tin, gold, silver, and lead. Um, and Cyprus is one of the five richest sources of copper in the world, with over 90 copper ore bodies in the, the upper and lower pillow lavas of the Trogos Mountains. Within this generally favorable environment, Lapithos is um, particularly well positioned. It's the only coastal settlement we know of on the north coast, and one of very few anywhere on the island in the Middle Bronze Age. It's located where the North Coastal Plain reaches its widest point of five kilometres, so it has the potential to sustain a reasonably large population. It has several small bays, which could have provided anchorages or beaching spots for ancient ships. It lies at the foot of Mount Kiparisobuno, 
uh, which is the highest peak of the Pendidactylos range, or the Kyrenia range, um, and which would certainly have served as a, a highly visible landmark for uh, passing ships. And it's also located midway between the two key passes through this part of the Pendidactylos range, uh, at Aguirre and Panagra, which offer the only access south from that northern coastal plain to the central lowlands, the Mesa and then onward to uh, the copper ore bodies in the Trodos Mountains. So being located between those two passes, it has the potential to control both of them. The clays of Lapithos are amongst the, the best in Cyprus for the production of pottery, and Lapithos has always been famous as a centre of pottery production. It has two major springs, Kefalogrisi and Risitubaba, which in recent times uh, have been used for perennial flow irrigation, making this one of the agriculturally most productive areas on the island. It also has the highest annual rainfall of all the coastal areas of Cyprus. Indeed, Myers, who led the Anglo-Cypriot Cypriot, uh, expedition of 1913, described Lapithos as one of the paradises of Cyprus. Another unique feature of Lapithos, which I suspect was very important in antiquity, uh, is that it has two defensible plateaus, which you can see on this beautiful picture that uh, was taken by the Swedish Cyprus expedition in 1927. Um, at Castros and Ionastasia, you can see these two very uh, uh, steep-sided, rocky uh, plateaus. Uh, we don't know where the ancient settlement of Lapithos was. Uh, it hasn't been excavated, but it was probably near, under the modern village, and no doubt, I suspect, close to and around and on those uh, two natural acropolises. So Lapithos is very well located. Uh, we need to remember, however, that if Lapithos or any other community on the north coast needed secure access to copper, either for their own uh, purposes or to feed into an international uh, network, uh, external network, they had to control those two passes south to the copper ore bodies in the Trogos. And they also had to be able to manage the intervening communication and transport routes. The nearest mining areas to the southwest are at Mbeliku and uh, in the, uh, around the ore bodies of Skuriotisa. That's about 40 kilometers away from Lapithos. Uh, in the, the southwest, uh, um, there are mines at Matiati, Shah, um, They're even uh, further away. Cyprus in the Middle Bronze Age, if you read the literature uh, that's current today, it's often described as small-scale, village-oriented, agrarian, conservative, and only minimally engaged, if engaged at all, in external trade. So the accepted wisdom is that it's not really until the end of this period, around about 1700 BC, and the transition to the Late Bronze Age, that social structures on Cyprus began to get uh, be become more complex, and the island opened up to the outside world. I think there are a number of problems with this uh, scenario, but I, I, I want to draw your attention uh, just to one of them. Almost everybody agrees that the ancient name of Cyprus was Alashia, or Alasia. There are references to Alashia in cuneiform uh, tablets from uh, Babylon, uh, Alak, and Mari in inland Syria, which indicate that they were receiving copper from the land of Alashia, from the late 19th century and or the early 18th century. And lead isotope analysis, which is a method that is used to identify the source of copper in copper and bronze artifacts, also suggests that Cypriot copper was in use in Crete, uh, in the Cyclades, and perhaps on the Greek mainland from the 19th century BC, if not earlier. So it would appear that one or more communities in Cyprus were providing copper for export to the Aegean and the Levant from the 19th century, at least. That is, during the Middle Bronze Age, the period that uh, we're interested in, at least 100 years before Cyprus is supposed to have opened up to the outside world. So there's a, something of a discrepancy between the archaeological evidence, as it's currently interpreted, and the textual and analytical data. And the anglo cypriot ex ex uh, excavations at Lapithos of 1913 have real potential to throw light on this uh, dilemma, because if Cyprus was supplying metal, copper, into an international trade work, in the first half of the second millennium, BC, it would almost certainly have been doing so for the, from the north coast. And if we're looking for a community on the north coast which might have been involved, then Lapithos is pretty well the only contender. Vulnus is another very important site on the north coast, 
It was a major site there in the early Bronze Age, but it, it falls really, uh, it decreases in importance in the, in the Middle Bronze Age, and it's also not located on the coast. So I think Lourdes may well have been involved as well, but Lapithos is the major um, site on the north coast at this time. Um, so, to the story. In 1913, John Myers, uh, who was Wickham Professor of Ancient History at the University of Oxford, was invited by the Cyprus Museum Committee to carry out excavations in Cyprus. He had already had a long uh, association with Cyprus, and Menelaos Marquides, uh, who was the first curator of the Cyprus Museum, had been a student of Myers at Oxford. The excavations were to be carried out with the assistance of Marquides in the name of the Cyprus Museum. All the finds were to remain in the Cyprus Museum, and the writing publication was to belong jointly to Myers and Marquides. Myers requested permission to bring an assistant, a young man, this is a photograph of him taken uh, much later in life, a young man called Leonard uh, Halford Dudley Buxton, who's known as Dudley Buxton. Buxton had done a degree in classics with Myers, uh, and he also had a diploma of physical anthropology. So I assume the thinking was that if they found skeletal human skeletal remains, he would be a very useful person to have with them. They excavated at Lefconico, uh, at Enkibi, uh, and Lambursa. And while we were working at Lambursa, which is, also, which is very close to Lapithos, they were told about tombs uh, at, uh, of the early and middle Bronze Age that had, been very, uh, that had been found very close by Lapithos and that were being disturbed or looted at that time. So they decided to work at that site as well. And it's at this point that Myers essentially leaves the picture. The task of excavating at Lapithos was given to Buxton and Marquides, while Myers went off to work at Kition in Lanaka. Marquides also had museum duties, so in effect the excavations were directed and recorded entirely by uh, Leonard Dudley Halford, uh, Leonard Halford Dudley Buxton. Over four weeks from the 20th of November to the 22nd of December, he supervised the excavation of 62 Bronze Age tombs at a locality known as Risi Tubaba, named after one of those uh, springs. And he also excavated another four Iron Age tombs in the hills above the village. That's something like 16 tombs a week, um, which is terrifying. Um, we're not told the size of his workforce, but in what he calls his day sheets, the entries for the first 21, um, for, sorry, the entries for um, 21 of the first 35 tombs record the name of the workmen or the workmen who were responsible for excavating those tombs. Um, and I'll just show you some of the, um, the extracts from his day notes here. This is tomb 15, which was excavated by Xenophon Mikhail, and you can see it says, well done. <laughs> this is tomb 35, which was excavated by Yoris Kosti, quite well. <laughs> This is tomb 21, which is a very important tomb, which was excavated by Nikos Kiriakou, not very well. Uh, and tomb, oh, sorry, this is doing funny names. Um, tomb 17, excavated by Pandelis Savas and Yanakis Christophi, and they got a B minus. <laughs> So this not only does this show that Buxton had a sense of humour, um, but it also shows that he had at least 27 different people working for him, because there are 27 different <coughs> names. Uh, and we, that's an underestimate because he does also mention uh, that there were women uh, working on site. So he had a very large team. So picture the scene. Buxton is 24 years old. Uh, apart from a season in the Sudan with the welcome expedition the year before, he's had no field experience. He's not an archaeologist, he's an anthropologist. He's never been to Cyprus before. He presumably has little or no familiarity with Cypriot pottery, although he may have studied some when he was a, a student of Myers, and little, if any, modern Greek. Myers, in fact, told him to bring a dictionary. Winter's coming on. He's got at least 30 people digging 10 or 15 tombs at the same time. And on top of this, his real interest was in the modern population. Remember, he's an anthropologist, physical anthropologist. Uh, during his time in Cyprus, he took, uh, he took cranial measurements and recorded the physical characteristics, the eye colour, the hair colour, the stature, of over a thousand living Cypriots. And he later published two very substantial uh, papers uh, on that work. He was also taking photographs, many of which are now in the Pitt Rivers Museum. Uh, the majority were taken to illustrate his anthropological work, so they show uh, 
um, people either facing forward or lined up sideways uh, like this. Others show uh, craft activities. He was very interested in traditional crafts and particularly spinning and weaving. There are general views of, um, uh, sorry, landscapes. This is a, a photograph taken in the hills above Lapithos. Um, there are general views of excavations. Um, people lined up uh, carrying picks and shovels. Unfortunately, none of them of the, the Bronze Age tombs that I'm interested in. I, I think this is probably at Lampusa. And there are, a, a, this is a picture of Myers and a small boy in a large jar. And he looks to me like he's measuring him up to see if he'll fit. Um, these, these are all online. They're, they're, there's no information about them other than uh, uh, Lapithos circa 1913. Um, but I've been in, in touch with the, the curator at the Pitt Rivers Museum and together I think we'll be able to identify a lot of these people. Um, this is Marquis taken in the courtyard of the Cyprus Museum. Um, and this, I'm pretty sure, is Buxton himself. Uh, taken on the same day in the Cyprus Museum, perhaps by Marquis. Um, now, I know he took photographs of his excavations because he mentions them in, in the notebooks, but I haven't been able to find them. They're not in the Pitt Rivers Museum, and as far as I know, they're not in the Institute of Archaeology at Oxford, which does hold photographs uh, that were taken uh, by Myers of his excavations in 1913. There's also a couple of, there's two photographs of skeletal material, um, a, a skull with a large C on it, and uh, a long bone, which is nicely propped up on a small pumpkin. <laughs> These are probably from the tombs that he excavated at Lapithos, but I can't really identify them beyond that. Buxton was also collecting ethnographic material, mostly tools, um, but also musical instruments and textiles, many of which are from Lapithos and Caravas, uh, which are now in the Pitt Rivers Museum, the British Museum, and elsewhere. Very interesting man. He went on to become the first reader of physical anthropology at Oxford. Uh, he died very young in 1939, at the age of only 49. Uh, and today he's a largely forgotten figure, at least in Cyprus. His work at Lapithos has never been acknowledged. It's, uh, it's attributed entirely to Myers in both the archival records and the published literature. Even Myers' obituary of Buxton notes only that in 1913 he took part in excavations in Cyprus. And yet it's to Buxton that we owe whatever information can now be retrieved on the tombs excavated at Lapithos in 1913. Unfortunately, Myers' early plans to publish his work in Cyprus uh, never eventuated. It's, that's not entirely surprising, given the intervention of World War I, uh, given Marquis' early retirement, he became uh, very ill, uh, Buxton's early death in 1939, and then World War II, which Myers was also involved in. It was not until 1946 uh, that Myers managed to publish a very brief summary report in the annual of the British School at Athens. In the interim, Ina Gerstad, who was the, the leader of the famous Swedish Cyprus expedition, had studied some of Buxton's notes, not all of them, and included brief descriptions of the tombs in his volume, Studies on Prehistoric Cyprus, which was published in 1926. Then Jim Stewart, the Australian archaeologist, and Paul Erstrom, the Swedish archaeologist, in their major studies of the early Middle Bronze Age, published in 1962 and 1972, respectively, uh, sorry, respectively, based their description of the tombs at Lapithos entirely on Gerstad. Neither of these great scholars went back to look at the archival record. In fact, both of them were firmly of the opinion that there were no such records. Hence, we get in the literature, I don't know what I'm doing, um, comments like this. This is Jim Stewart from Sydney University uh, referred to the Lapithos tombs as a cloud on the horizon, mostly unknown and probably unknowable. And then Paul Erstrom um, recognised the importance of these tombs, but uh, believed that we couldn't do much with them because there are no tomb plans with the Fines Institute available. Um, Lack of publication is a particularly serious problem in the case of Lapithos. Um, so the, the 1913 excavations were not published. Myers re uh, returned to the site in, uh, in 1917 and dug another 18 tombs. They were not published. The Swedish Cyprus expedition dug 25 tombs in 1927 and they did publish them in a very, what well, at the time was a state-of-the-art publication in 1934. The Pennsylvania Museum um, excavated 38 tombs in 1931. They have never been published. And the Department of Antiquities has rescue excavated over the years a number of tombs at Lapithos, uh, 25 tombs, but they also remain unpublished. 
So that adds up to only 25 um, uh, tombs that have been published, or 15% of the entire number that have been excavated. This is where things stood when I started uh, the project, uh, in uh, my project in, in 2016. The aim of which is to, to fully document and publish both the 62 tombs dug uh, by Buxton in 1913 and the 18 tombs dug by Mikevis in 1917. The project uh, has received funding from the Shelby White Leon Levy Program for Archaeological Publications, which is administered by Harvard University, and it's being undertaken in very close collaboration with the Science Department of Antiquities. And of course, it could not be un uh, happening at all without their total commitment. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have already managed to publish the first 18 tombs uh, that were dug by, sorry, the, the 18 tombs that were dug by Mikevis in 1917 in a volume which came out late last year. So the figures are looking a little bit healthier, with 43 or 26 percent of the tombs now published, but there's still a very long way to go. So let's look at the archival record. The first thing I was given when I uh, uh, went to the Cyprus Museum um, were these three red folders, and one of which, I don't know whether you can see, it says Lapithos plans. So it's immediately evident that there are plans, um, despite um, what I have been led to believe. Um, uh, so it is clear that in the midst of, the, of what must have been considerable chaos, Buxton not only kept daily field notes, what he calls his day sheets, he did draw plans of all the tombs with the finds in situ, and exceptionally, he sketched almost all the finds. So essentially the record uh, consists of two interim reports on the excavations, one written by Buxton on the ship going back to the UK, and one written by Marquides for the private secretary of the High Commissioner. A more extensive typed report on each tomb by Buxton, what he called his tomb lists, written after his return to Oxford, a handwritten inventory of the finds compiled by Marquides, and in the second of the red folders, Buxton's day sheets, annotated pencil drawn plans of all the tombs and sketch drawings of the pottery, metal and other finds. The tomb plans were drawn in the field and in a hurry, and remember he's got all those tombs being excavated at the same time. Some of them are, are quite straightforward. This is tomb 28, together with the sketches he did of the pots and the metal from that tomb. They're relatively neat. Um, in this case, it's been, uh, they've been quite easy to digitise. Uh, both the plan and the sketches and put them back together. Others of them are really messy uh, and, and bordering on incomprehensible. This is especially true of the larger tombs where there are four or five plans of the same tomb without any indication of how they fit together. In most cases there's also no north arrow and the other thing that is missing is the site plan. I know there was a site plan because he talks about how he drew the site plan. It appears not to be in the Cypress Museum uh, and yet Ulbrich at the Ashmolean has very kindly uh, looked for it in the, in the Myers archive in the Ashmolean, but unfortunately uh, was not. A, it doesn't appear to be there either. If anybody has any idea where the site plan might be, I would be hugely grateful. The drawings also get messier over time and more cramped until with tomb 50, uh, which produced uh, almost 500 objects, he gave up trying to draw them all. Despite the difficulties, these plans and drawings are an enormously valuable resource, and one which I thought we didn't have when I started. There's one more thing. In, in 1915, Marquis arranged for over 60 photographs <coughs> to be taken of the Lapithos finds. The um, pots were placed in tomb groups and the metal in type groups. Now these again are really valuable, but they've also been misunderstood. These are not complete uh, groups even though they have been considered to be complete. For example, only 49 of, of 120 inventory vessels from tomb 21 were photographed. So that the chronology of this tomb, as um, uh, assigned by Gerstein and following Gerstein, Stuart and Erstrom from the photographs, is based on less than 50% of the actual assemblage, and therefore could quite possibly be wrong. As far as the metal goes, uh, in the case of relatively rare objects like axes, most of them made it into the photograph. In the case of very common objects like knives, of which there are over 300, less than half of the inventory examples made it into the photograph. The same is true of the spearheads. So once again, these have been assumed to be complete type group assemblages, and as a result, the, the, the amount of metal recovered in 1913 has been massively underestimated, all because nobody went back and looked at the inventories. In fact, the inventories um, for 1913 and 1917 tell us that 1,125 metal artefacts were accessioned 
along with 1,807 pottery vessels, 139 spindle wells, 23 <coughs> plank figures, and 62 other objects. In total, 3,156 3, objects. Now, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, not all of this material can now be found. A uh, hundred years is a very long time in a storeroom. And a lot has happened to this material. I'll mention just two things. Firstly, the uh, inventory numbers were not marked on the objects. But in the case of the pots, they were uh, written on little white stickers, which I think you can see some of there. And in the case of the metal, on small white labels tied on with very thin cotton thread. Now, those didn't last very long at all. Um, in fact, when Gerstadt arrived in Cyprus in 1924, he reports that most of the labels had been eaten by insects or dropped off. And that was also the fate of little bits of paper that Buxton stuck inside some of the pots in the field, which we, in some cases, we found those bits of paper still there, and we tried desperately hard to read what was on them, um, and sometimes we could. But you can see the insects have done an enormous amount of damage. This loss of labels is a huge problem. As we work through the trays of pottery, um, from each tomb we find that quite a few of them are missing. Uh, I presume those are pots which lost their labels very uh, long ago and ended up in some kind of general from Lapithos collection in the museum. The situation is very much worse with the metal. Uh, when I started this project, only about 250 of the 1,125 accessioned metal objects could be located in the museum. I then spent weeks, I think it was six weeks, going tray by tray through all the unprovenanced metal in the Cyprus Museum. Um, to see if I could identify any of the missing objects using the 1915 photographs. Uh, and I, I, I was um, reasonably successful. I was able to uh, identify by matching objects in the Unprovenance collection with these uh, group photographs uh, another 200 or so, uh, still less than half the original assemblage. Uh, my guess is that all the remaining metal, metal uh, is in the unprovenanced uh, metal collection, but we'll never be able to identify it specifically. Secondly, it would appear uh, that some, if not all, of the tomb groups were buried in the courtyard of the museum during the Second World War. Uh, now, Vassos Karyotikis, who was the director of the Department of Antiquities for many years, told me this. Uh, he told me that uh, when the museum was evacuated, the, the objects that were on um, Um, on exhibition were taken to the, Belopice, the Abbey at Belopais for safekeeping and the pottery in the storerooms was buried in the courtyard. And Vassos remembers in 1952 watching them uh, dig this pottery up again from the courtyard. Uh, I suspect that uh, episode may explain why some of the material uh, was more complete in 1915 when it was photographed than it, is, than it was in 2016 when we, we uh, re-photographed it I just lined up the pots in the same way as they were on the original photograph. Every pot that has an arrow is missing a bit that it had in 1915. It may also explain why some of the tomb groups are missing altogether. It may be, as Vassal suggested to me, that not all of them were dug up again. Um, so there have been a lot of challenges along the way. But let me show you some of what we have been able to achieve so far, remembering that this is a work in progress. Our basic task is to, uh, uh, to publish, uh, sorry, to document and publish the tombs in their content. That means drawing and photographing every object. This is my, you can see how small my team is. It's a slow and painstaking process, uh, particularly as all the pots are handmade. So no two pots are the same, and many of them are highly decorated. Uh, that's particularly true uh, of the, uh, the red polish wear pots. I'm just showing you a selection here. Pots, figurines, uh, spindle wells which require quite some time to draw, and through all the white painted wear, which is, by definition, uh, decorated. Those are the two main pottery types in the assemblage. So after three six-week seasons in the museum, we've documented 989 objects, with at least another, around about 2,000 to count. Um, beyond this basic task, our objective is to add value wherever we can and provide a resource for other scholars, which. Uh, they can use now and into the future. So all of this material is being uh, made available in digital form in the archives of the Cyprus Museum and uploaded on open access media when we publish it. So what can I tell you about the Middle Bronze Age of Lapithos as a result of our work so far? Firstly, with the information um, from, the, uh, from the archives, uh, the 1963 aerial uh, photograph of the area and the help of our friends from the Lapithos Council in Exile, 
we've been able to identify the excavated area and locate the tombs uh, that were dug in 1913 and 1917 in relation to those excavated in 1927 and 1931. Except for the, uh, with the exception of the Western, uh, 1931 Western tombs, none of these tombs are visible any longer on the ground. They were covered over and, and plowed over at the time. Um, they lie in these fields within 100 to 300 metres of the coastline and they cover about 10 hectares with additional tombs apparently uh, spreading off uh, in, in all directions beyond that. So the extent of the burial ground from east to west must have been about one kilometre. Very large cemetery in use for about 300 years and not the only burial ground in this period at Lapidus. So this was a densely inhabited area with a, a substantial population at this time. We have so far been able to uh, reconstruct about uh, reconstruct 39 of the tomb groups. The tombs are rock cut chambers. This is one of the uh, western tombs, which, which is still visible on the ground. It was fenced off in the early 1970s. Uh, and the chambers uh, were uh, open from the bottom of this uh, rectangular shaft. You can see the openings to a number of chambers there. Um, some tombs have uh, single um, chambers. Others have uh, two, uh, three or four burial chambers. The size and structural complexity of the tombs increased over time so that the earliest tombs, which date to the last phase of the early Bronze Age, are typically small uh, with just one chamber, uh, while uh, largest, the largest tombs of the Middle Bronze Age are very large, multi-chambered, and contain many more bodies and many more objects per body. So we might have one or two bodies and 10 or 15 objects in an early tomb and 10 or more bodies and over 400 objects in one of the later tombs. At the same time, not all the tombs are large and rich. Um, in all periods of use of the cemetery, there are some tombs which stand out, suggesting or stand apart, suggesting a degree of inequality and wealth of wealth and status in the in the community. There's also a very substantial increase in the amount of metal deposited uh, with the dead over time, and a concentration of metal in some of the larger tombs. You can see that here in uh, Chamber 18A, uh, which produced 128 metal artifacts. In fact. 72% of all the metal comes from 10 of the excavated tombs, each of which has over 40 objects, and 35% comes from only three tombs, each of which has over 100 objects. But given that these burial chambers are likely to have been family tombs, this suggests that over time, some family groups acquired a much greater capacity than others to accumulate metal wealth. There's also a significant number of imports, and these correlate, not surprisingly, with the larger metal-rich tombs. So it would seem that the families that controlled the metal wealth also had greater access to imported goods, which include necklaces, pendants, and other small items of faience, silver, lead, and gold, objects of copper and bronze, and a few pottery vessels. The tin used to make the bronze objects also uh, was imported. There's no tin in Cyprus. More controversially, uh, and certainly surprisingly, lead isotope analysis of 89 metal objects from the Swedish excavations at Lapithos suggests that slightly over half of them are made of copper which is likely to have come from sources in modern-day Iran, Turkey and the Aegean. It doesn't prove that, but it suggests that. In other words, a significant amount of copper uh, might also have been coming in uh, from outside the island. We also, of course, have an enormous amount of pottery. The broad sequence uh, is clear. The earliest tombs uh, on that side of the screen uh, only have red polished ware. The middle phase tombs have red polished ware and some uh, early white painted ware and the later ones have late red polished, late white painted and uh, what we call red slip and, uh, and black slip. There's a lot more we can do to refine the chronological sequences uh, and, and uh, look at pottery in many other ways, but most people get very bored by pottery, so I'm not to say anything more, other than uh, to tell you a little bit about what Maria Zico Mijuelviandu has been doing um, with this material. She has been conducting an elemental uh, analysis of the pottery using portable X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, or PXRF, and together with Marcos Martinon Torres has published the results of the first analytical program in the volume which came out last year. This is a really important part of the project, which you'll be hearing more about tomorrow. It allows us to characterize the pottery from Lapithos in terms of its chemical composition and identify pots that are likely to have come from other settlements. And that's, uh, that's very useful because it's telling us something about Lapithos's connections with other regions of the island. What is already clear uh, is that Lapithos's closest connection in terms of pottery uh, were with Venya. Venya is located, you can see it on the map there, about halfway between Lapithos and the mining settlements in the Troas. So it's not surprising that they would have been closely connected. 
Um, there's a great deal of chemical um, overlap between the locally produced vessels from Lapithos and those that have come in from Venya. The Venya pots are generally higher, uh, I have sorry, lower in um, chromium and nickel. It's also uh, clear with uh, some um, red soup uh, pottery from eastern Cyprus, which has very good parallels at Ios Jakobos, which again stand apart chemically uh, from the local red and black slip. What's really interesting is that the pots that reach Lapithos from Venya um, are tablewares, nice decorated bowls, jugs, juglets and flasks, along with cooking pots and spindle wells. This suggests the presence of people. It suggests that people are moving between sites and taking the material culture with them. Whereas the pots from the east are storage vessels, suggesting a different kind of connection and the movement uh, primarily of commodities rather than of individuals. Okay, the metal uh, is uh, an extraordinary collection and it's very well preserved. We can see, for example, the leather binding on the tangs of the spearheads, which was used presumably to keep the, the, it firm in the haft. We can see remnants of mineralized textiles. This knife, for example, must have been wrapped in a cloth or placed in a bag. The fiber um, has been sampled and analyzed uh, in Copenhagen and proved to be uh, flax, linen. Uh, there are traces of textiles on, um, on uh, many of the pins, which is not surprising because they were used to fasten clothing or perhaps the shroud of the dead. Um, some of the pins also have thread or string attached uh, around the lower shaft. Uh, and sometimes we can see decoration, thanks to these amazing photographs that uh, our photographer is taking. Um, and whether you can see uh, a herringbone pattern on that one and uh, also see <coughs> Uh, decoration on this one. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Andreas Haranambos from the University of Cyprus has carried out compositional analysis again using portable XRF on over 400 uh, metal objects from these tombs and his very important results show that 14% of the assemblage is pure copper, 36% uh, is arsenical copper, an alloy of copper and arsenic, 29% um, of arsenical tin bronze, an alloy of copper, arsenic and tin, and 20% of tin bronze, an alloy of Tin. This is a much higher incidence of tin than we expected. Tin bronze is not supposed to have become common until the end of the Middle Bronze Age. Um, and the tin is certainly been important. We can also look at how they were using tin. This graph shows the percentage uh, of objects of each type which contain, which are tin alloys. Um, on your right, you'll see that spearheads are least likely uh, to contain tin. They're primarily made of uh, pure copper or arsenical copper. Which is not surprising. These are very large objects. Um, this one is, is the largest uh, of all, 700, 775 grams, um, which probably depended primarily uh, on their momentum at impact uh, to be effective. So there was no mechanical benefit in them having hard, um, sharpened edges. Um, so you wouldn't waste precious tin uh, on an object like that. On the other hand, uh, the highest levels of tin appear in the toggle pins at the other side of the screen, pins with holes in them. 76% of toggle pins contain tin. So there's something else going on here. There's no mechanical advantage in using tin for a dress pin, but tin affects the colour of the metal. The more tin, the more gold in the colour. So this is about people showing off. This is about aesthetics. Uh, the colour, size and weight of toggle pins, which is you wore, um, were uh, possibly used to express prestige. So this is something telling you something very interesting about the way people were valuing metal and the way they were targeting precious tin for certain kinds of objects. So to sum up the, the, um, the situation as regards the metal, there's a very large amount of metal at Lapithos, uh, 140 tombs, uh, that is those exported uh, in all years, uh, produce a total of 1,840 metal objects, five times the number recovered, for example, from Vunus, and much, much more than anywhere else on the island. There's a high incidence of tin, uh, both the sheer quantity of metal and the fact that some objects uh, of, are of types that are only found at Bacchus suggests that a lot of metalworking was going on locally, and the local metalsmiths seem to have had a high level of expertise. They chose particular alloy recipes for particular artifacts. And local and, impossible, and possibly imported copper, imported tin, and either imported arsenic sulfide or the high arsenic copper ores from the other side of the island were available at Lapithos in significant quantities, along with smaller amounts of imported lead, silver, and gold. Just one more thing before I bring all this together, and this is the, the incidence of spearheads at Lapithos. We have at least 221 spearheads. 
of which you can see 20 examples here. These are specialised weapons. They could have been used for hunting as well, but they are certainly um, weapons. Knives could also have been used as weapons, as well as tools, certainly in the case of the larger ones. And the same is true of axes and mace heads. The quantity of uh, weapons, potential weapons at Lapithos, is particularly striking when we compare the number of spearheads with those found at other sites across the island. But what is going on here? There's long been a tendency in Cypriot studies, and more broadly, to see weapons like this uh, as symbols of prestige and male identity, rather than as functional weapons that might have been used for, for, for killing people. This is changing now, certainly changing um, uh, beyond Cyprus, um, particularly with, with useware studies that are being done on metal now. We'll hear more about this from Sarah Douglas tomorrow. Um, people who've looked at spearheads like this from prehistoric Ireland and Scandinavia are finding evidence to suggest that they were actually used. They find the kind of damage that can only have been a result of them being used for fighting. Um, and I think we've got the same kind of evidence on our spearheads. We haven't done any microscopic analysis, but I think in some cases, just with the naked eye, you can see evidence for, um, on, the, uh, on my right, your left, um, what looks like a, a mark that has been made by another weapon um, uh, hitting the, the middle of the blade. Uh, it's also caused a slight displacement, slight curve in the blade. Uh, this one's got a, a cut along the edge, and these ones have got what I would refer to as tip damage. So if they've been, they've been uh, stabbed into something uh, hard enough to, to damage the, the end of it. Um, so let me try and bring all this together. Uh, it seems clear from the evidence that we have uh, that Lapithos was la a large and important coastal settlement in the Middle Bronze Age, probably involved in the export of Cypriot copper, and almost certainly, although we have no settlement evidence to prove it, manufacturing artifacts using local copper, some imported copper, and imported tin. We have evidence also of imported weapons, tools, and pins of copper and bronze, and jewellery of found lead, silver, and gold. The number of weapons suggests that people at Lapithos were prepared to defend their economically privileged position, perhaps against both internal and external threats. Remember those defensible plateaus. The burial evidence further suggests a degree of inequality in the community, with some tombs much richer than others, and increasingly so over time. The concentration of metal imports and weapons in some tombs suggests that the management of metal production and ex export was in the hands of certain groups, and correspondingly, that wealth, access to foreign goods and social status were in the hands of some families over generations. It seems entirely possible that the copper from Alashia, that is from Cyprus, which reached Mari, Babylon, Crete and the Cyclades in the first half of the second millennium, did so via Lapithos. This must mean that Lapithos was highly connected internally in order to ensure a secure supply of copper from the mines, which are up to 40 kilometres away. Indeed, it would have had to be doing so even to supply its own workshops, and there's no denying that metal in some form was getting to consumers at Lapithos in large quantities. So Lapithos must have been able to mobilise a set of internal networks that linked it to the mining settlements in the Trodos and to transport and communication routes from the mining settlements to the north coast, perhaps via the routes that I've suggested here. This may have involved coercion, hence all the weapons, there's no doubt that some groups at Lapithos had the capacity to aggressively protect their wealth. And it must have involved very close connections with mining settlements such as those at Enverikul and Katilata, and settlements located on transportation routes such as those at Denia and Iopas TV, which is modern Lucia. It's absolutely clear that Lapithos had the ability to contest and secure access to copper supplies over considerable distances for several centuries. Lapidos was not the only large settlement uh, in this system, although again we have only the evidence of cemeteries. It's clear that both Denia and Ayaparaskevi were large population centres. At Denia in particular, a number of very large cemeteries suggest that there was a massive increase in population in the Middle Bronze Age, and Ayaparaskevi may have been the same. Even at smaller sites, we have increasing evidence for specialised production in the Middle Bronze Age. At Ambeliku, uh, which is a permanent minor, minor, was a permanent minor settlement of the Mill Bronze Age, located on this hillside, opposite an, uh, an ancient copper mine. Uh, excavations here by Porfirius Dikios, the Cypriot uh, archaeologist in 1942, uncovered workshops for, melting, for smelting, casting and uh, producing ingots, um, and for manufacturing pottery. And at Irimi, 
uh, on the, the Curis River to the west of Limassol. Luca Bombardieri and his team, some of you are here tonight, um, are uncovering a very substantial Middle Bronze Age uh, workshop which appears to have been used for the production of woolen textiles. At Irimi, there is also evidence to suggest increasing concerns about security in the form of a circuit wall. Uh, we're not supposed to have walled settlements in Cyprus in the early Middle Bronze Age, now we have one. And it may well be that we don't have them anywhere else because we haven't dug in the right places. We have dug inside, we haven't tried to look for anything uh, surrounding the settlement. This, I think, is now being uh, excavated to about 80 meters. Um, there's also evidence for um, quite complex locking mechanisms in the, the doorways to the, the rooms in the workshop. Um, so I don't think these were isolated agricultural villages waiting for the late Bronze Age, uh, but rather communities targeting particular resources and producing surplus goods for distribution within well-defined regional networks. Indeed, the picture of the uh, Middle Bronze Age, which is now emerging, also through Lindy Crew's work at Kisonigar in the southwest, is of a period of significantly greater complexity and diversity than some current views allow, and considerable more, considerably more uh, internal mobility and external connection. All of which predates, and I suspect, uh, and I think, uh, will help us to explain the developments which occurred in the early years of the late Bronze Age, which once and for all opened Cyprus up to the Eastern Mediterranean world. So I hope I have been able to persuade you that the efforts to publish the anglo of excavations of 1913 are worthwhile, and that the potential of this material is enormous. And that Lapithos, far from being a cloud upon the horizon, mostly unknown and probably unknowable, can be regarded as one of the most important sites in Middle Bronze Age Cyprus. Thanks to the work of Buxton, Marquides, the Swedish Cyprus Expedition, the Pennsylvania Museum and the Department of Antiquities, it is certainly one of the most extensively excavated, and I hope when we have completed our work, if we ever get to complete our work, we will uh, be able to say that it is one of the most extensively documented as well. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and to, to come nearly full circle, I just want to leave you with uh, this faded but really charming photograph uh, taken in 1937, which shows Marquides just before he died, <coughs> 24 years after the excavations at Lapithos in 1913, sitting outside the uh, Cyprus Museum in the sunshine. I like to imagine them reminiscing about their uh, work in 1913. Thank you very much. <laughs>